The following program is made possible by generous gifts from partners of Benny Hinn Ministries and viewers like you in this area. And I pray today's message will touch your heart mightily. I'm teaching on the covenant meal, communion. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19 and 20, it says, And Jesus took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament or covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Today, I pray the Lord will minister the riches of His Word, and I pray this teaching will change your life for the glory of our precious Jesus. Lord, I pray this be a mighty time in you, in Jesus' name, amen. Be fed and be blessed today. Go with me to a most powerful uh, and a very familiar portion of God's Word. I want you all to go to Exodus. The book of Exodus first. Chapter 24. And stay there with me for a minute. And Cheryl for a moment, please. Before we read the portion in Exodus 24, I want you to place your hand on the Bible now, before we even begin. I'm asking God tonight to give you a revelation of His Word that will change your life. Amen? So place your hand on Exodus 24 and pray out loud, Dear Lord Jesus, reveal your Word to my heart. Impart your truth and change my life. And I pray tonight by the Holy Spirit, my life will be transformed in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason I had you open to that particular chapter is because this is where God Almighty began to reveal to Israel what I'm about to talk to you about. In Jesus, the mystery of God has come, and in Jesus, this mystery has taken residence in us. Now, I'll explain what the mystery is in a moment. But I want to repeat this one truth that in Jesus Christ, the mystery of God has come to each one of us and has taken residence in us. In Jesus, we have become a part of divine, eternal reality. I'll explain that in a minute. Just write it down. In Jesus, we have become a part of God's eternal reality because everything this world presents is not reality. Only in God is reality. In Jesus, we've become part of the eternal love of God which is true reality because only in Jesus Christ do we find this reality. What is that reality? What do I mean by reality? We are God's people. We have been found. We have been forgiven. 
we have been made anew by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we worship and we give thanks. And as we worship and as we give thanks, we become established in the reality of Jesus Christ. The reality of Jesus Christ is at the center of what I call the covenant meal. In that covenant meal, there is reality. Everything outside Christ has no reality. Everything outside Jesus has no truth in it whatsoever. Anything outside Jesus is a lie. People may call it reality. It's not reality. True reality. He is reality. He is the I am. He is eternal love. He is existence itself. He is life. Jesus is. In that one magnificent statement is the truth of God himself. He said to Moses, I am. He did not have to say any more. Jesus said, if you do not believe I am, you will die in your sins. He didn't say I have. He did not say I was. He did not say I will be. He said, I am. God is. The first words in the Bible, in the beginning, God. That's all we need to really hear. God is. That is reality. That is truth. Remember what I said to you a few weeks ago. Truth is centered in Jesus. If you take Jesus out, there is no truth. People don't know where to find it. A lie becomes true if Jesus is absent. He is the point of all truth. He is the focus of all truth. He is the center of all truth. He is the truth. For he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. In him is life. He is life. He is truth. Therefore, he is reality. Anything outside Jesus is not real. So in Jesus, the mystery of God has come to us human beings. The mystery of God resides in us. The reality of God resides in us. We've become a part of his eternal love, that true reality. We are found, we are forgiven, we are made new by the Holy Spirit. Now we worship and we give thanks. As we worship and give thanks, we become established in the truth, in that reality. When I say truth and when I say reality, I say the same thing. For truth is reality. He is truth and he is reality. The covenant meal brings us into that reality of Christ brings us into the truth of who He is. This is where we meet God. This is where we partake of His death, conquering life. This is where we are embraced by His eternal love. And this is where we participate in the covenant of promises. I want to repeat that because what I just said is a lot. At the center of that 
reality is the covenant meal. And when we come to that meal, we meet God. When we come to that meal, we partake of His death conquering life. When we partake of that meal, we are embraced by His eternal love. When we partake of that meal, we participate in the covenant of promises. The covenant meal is known by other names. Holy Communion is one name for the covenant meal. The Eucharist is another name for the covenant meal. The Great Thanksgiving is another name for the covenant meal. The Lord's Supper is another name for the covenant meal. The Mass, Catholics call it the Mass, that's just another name for the covenant meal. I'm talking about an experience with Jesus Christ that very few Christians truly understand and have lost the truth of it. And that is the reason why so many believers today are afflicted in their souls by devils. Hear what I just said. This is why many are afflicted in their bodies by disease. They have forgotten what the truth of Christ is. This meal, which is the center of reality, this is where we meet God. This is where we partake of God. This is where we are embraced by God. God. This is where we participate in the promises of God and they become ours as we eat the meal. The early church never argued about this. The early church did, did not have to have a scientific explanation for what the meal is. They simply embraced it with faith. It's a mystery. But today, this meal we call Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, sadly has become the battleground between believers. For centuries, Christians have argued about what does it mean? Is it symbolic? Is it not symbolic? Paul the, the Apostle had to deal with this same truth with the church in Corinth to remind them what that meal is all about. For many, if not most, it's the most misunderstood practice of the Christian faith. For most Christians, it is the most misunderstood practice of our faith. We don't understand it. When we practice it, we don't get it. For centuries, Christians have argued about it, this holy communion, this meal of the Lord. Some have literally gone to war over this truth. Divisions have come in the church over this truth. Sadly, it's been ignored, it's been forgotten in today's seeker-friendly society. In today's churches today, Holy Communion is misunderstood. Most places completely ignored. Yet, it is the center of the Christian faith. This meal is at the heart of the Christian faith. It is the heart of the covenant. I've been talking about the covenant for the last few weeks. But if you really want to know something, I'll tell you. The heart of the covenant is this meal. 
Now, let's, let's view this meal. Let's look at this meal through the lens of the covenant. Let's see it through the lens of the scriptures. Let's not argue about it as people have for the last 2,000 years. Let's look at it clearly, biblically. And I pray, dear Jesus, tonight, that as I'm ministering the word, that you will open the hearts of your people to receive it. Lift your hands to heaven, every one of you, for just a few minutes. Father, I cannot teach this without your help. Blessed Holy Spirit, I cannot bring this truth unless you help me deliver it properly, with clarity, with power, with insight and revelation. I cannot deliver this truth to your people if it's only through words, through my vehicle. Lord, my vehicle is not enough. I need your anointing on my voice and my words become as piercing blessed fire into the hearts of men in Jesus name take my words and make what I say life in Jesus name and God's people said Amen. because this truth requires the Holy Spirit I cannot just talk about it teach it because you won't get it it's a revelation. Every covenant in Scripture, now we're, we are looking, we're looking at, this, at this meal through the lens of the covenant. Every covenant in Scripture ended with a meal. Because that meal declared, listen, it declared that the covenant was now valid. Every meal declared it was now functional in the lives of the parties to it. You cannot make the covenant functional. Uh, you, you, you cannot make the covenant functional and valid without a meal. So you have two parties coming into covenant, yet the Bible says. At that meal, which happens at the end of the covenant, it ends with a meal, it closes with a meal, and when the meal is partaken, then it declares, with that meal, you declare that the covenant has become valid. You declare that now it is functional. You declare that it is functional in your life and the life of the other individual or individuals with whom you've come into covenant. So in Genesis chapter 26, verse 28 through 31, we find this remarkable truth. As we begin to see it in Scripture, God begins to present this to us in the Scripture where we see Abimelech and Isaac made a covenant and they said, I want to read now, I'm reading Genesis 26 verse 28. They said, we saw certainly that the Lord was with thee and we said, let there be now an oath betwixt us, or between us, even betwixt us and thee. Let us make a covenant with thee. Now watch what, what happens as we, we keep reading verse 29 through 31. That thou will do us no hurt as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord, and he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. There they ate the covenant meal, which declared the covenant became valid and functional at that moment. We see the same thing in Genesis chapter 31, beginning at verse 44 through 46, with Laban and Jacob. 
for the Bible tells us, Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, I and thou, this is Laban and Jacob talking, I and thou, let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it up for a pillar. And Jacob said unto his brethren, Gather stones, and they took stones and made an heap, and they did eat there upon the heap. They ate. There was a meal offered. There was a meal eaten. Why? It declared their covenant valid. Now, there's something many of us do not pay attention to between God and Abraham. If you go back to Genesis 18, you see something fascinating. The Lord had made a covenant with Abraham, but he had to wait. And he waited 14 years to see the promise of it. God did not fulfill the promise until he had a meal with Abraham. It was the meal that brought the promise into reality. God made the promise in Genesis 12. But in Genesis 18, God shows up in the form of a man. And what does he do? He eats with Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, verse 6. And Abraham hastened into the tent, and Sarah said, Make ready unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. So Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, said to Sarah, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. And now she not only goes and does that, but she also makes cakes. Abraham ran, verse 7 says, Unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good, gave it unto a young man. He hasted to dress it. He took butter, he took milk, and the calf, and he had dressed it, he had which he had dressed and set it before them, that is before the Lord. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. It was the Lord who was eating. The Lord came in the form of a man to eat dinner with Abraham. For the covenant could not become valid without that meal. And the minute he ate the meal, look what God said right after that. Verse 10, and he said, I will certainly now return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. God made the promise in Many years earlier, this is almost 14 years later. Therefore, a meal brings about the promise. Now, I'm going to say something to you in just a moment that's going to amaze you. Every promise of God becomes reality during that meal. We participate in the promises of we partake of the promises. That is why many Christians cannot receive from God anything, for they have never had a proper meal with Him. In communion, they don't know what they're doing. God cannot deliver any promise without eating with you first. He made the promise to Abraham 14 years earlier. But he had to have lunch with him to give it to him. Are you getting it? Yeah. Now he says to him, now, now that we've eaten together, I will certainly return. And I will fulfill my promise to you and you'll have a son. Verse 11 says, Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. It ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She could not even conceive a boy, but it didn't matter because that meal brought forth the promise. Therefore Sarah laughed, verse 12 says, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? 
And the Lord said to Abraham, wherefore did she laugh? Why did she laugh? Shall I, he said, watch this, saying, shall I of a surety bear a child with which am old? She's asking this question and God is repeating it. Why did she laugh? Why, why, why did she say that? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And God says, now at the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But God did not give him a son till they had a meal. Because the meal made the covenant valid. The meal was the signal that the covenant promise was about to be fulfilled. Oh, this is awesome. The children of Israel were given God's promise of deliverance 400 years before they ever saw it. God gave that promise to Abraham. Now God raised Moses. God raised Moses, sent him down to Egypt. Egypt is destroyed. Pharaoh just will not let them go. God hardens his heart to glorify his name and declare his power. Yet my brother and sister, they could not be delivered without dinner. And God said, now prepare to have dinner. Because when you have dinner, I'm showing up during the dinner. At the covenant meal, we are embraced by God. At the covenant meal, we participate in the promises of the covenant. The promises become ours only as we eat. Whoa, my brother. If you don't get excited, it's because you're dead. And I don't think we have dead people in this house tonight. I think you've been resurrected to newness of life. You cannot receive from God without dinner. It doesn't become valid without dinner. It doesn't become functional without dinner. Hallelujah. So God makes the promise to Abraham 14 years earlier, but Abraham doesn't see a son till God shows up for dinner. In that case, it was lunch. Now the children of Israel, God gave them promises for their deliverance, said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. Nothing happened. Moses shows up. Egypt is destroyed, but they're still slaves. Pharaoh's got nothing left. They are still slaves. The land is ruined. They are still slaves. Why? Dinner time hasn't shown up yet. But on that last night, God says, get dinner ready. Get that lamb. Cook it. Apply the blood and eat it. God did not even wait for dessert to show up. <laughs> he showed up before dessert. Before they could finish eating, the Lord was already there. They were freed while they ate. They were delivered while they ate. Do you understand? While you eat, you'll be healed. While you eat, you'll be delivered. While you eat, the devils of hell will be crushed under your foot. It's not about symbolism. It's about covenant. It's about reality. It's about power. It's about meeting God face to face. Take your seats. I want to keep teaching. It's not about symbolism. It's not symbolic. 
So God makes a covenant now with Israel. The children of Israel were delivered from slavery during dinner. He delivered them from slavery during what? Dinner. During what? Dinner. Not before dinner. During dinner. Oh, brother, how many dinners have you missed? How many dinners have you missed? You've missed your deliverance. You've missed your freedom. You've missed your healing. You've missed your liberty because you did not show up for dinner. He was there, but where were you? The covenant made at Sinai. This is, this is one of the most amazing, amazing portions of God's Word. It just blows my mind, frankly, that God would actually do it. He makes a covenant at Sinai, which we call the Old Covenant. It's recorded in Exodus 24, which I had you open to earlier and lay hands on. But before that covenant became valid, God has to have dinner with Moses and all the elders of Israel. They showed up for dinner in Exodus 24. So the Bible says in verse 1, God makes the covenant, but it doesn't become valid till he has dinner with them. It says, and God said unto Moses, come up. This is verse 1. Come up unto the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, their children, his sons, 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the, near the Lord, and they shall not come nigh. Therefore, it says, neither shall the, the people go up with him. But watch what it, what, what it says now. This is awesome. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And the people said, we'll do it. We'll do what the Lord says. And Moses, verse 4, wrote all the words of the law, uh, all the words of the, of the Lord. This is the law. This is what we call the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was given in this chapter. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and builds an altar under the hill and, and puts 12 pillars according to the tribes of Israel. And he sent young men, it says, into the camp that offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled all the people and the book. But watch what happens there in verse 9. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the word of heaven in his clearness. Watch this. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, also they saw God and did eat and drink. Dinner was served. God served them dinner. It doesn't tell us who cooked it. It says God had dinner with the elders. God had dinner with Moses. God had dinner with Aaron and his sons. To make the covenant that was just made valid to make it functional you cannot have a valid covenant without dinner so god makes the covenant in this verse i should say in this chapter god makes the covenant in this chapter beginning at verse one he gives the law to israel the blood is applied but it doesn't become valid until dinner they ate with My God, it's time to have dinner. God ate with man. What did Jesus do in Jerusalem on that last night? What did he do? He said, let's have dinner. To make the covenant valid. God the Son, in making the new covenant valid, ate a meal with his disciples. He sent Peter. He sent John. He sent James. He said, go make ready. And they went and found an upper room and furnished it and brought the food. 
and they reenacted the Passover at dinner. And during dinner, the new covenant became valid. Luke 22, verse 19. Look what Jesus said. And we read this sometimes and don't get the power of it. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup. After supper, saying, after what? Supper. supper, dinner had to be served. The cup, he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. The new covenant in my blood. What does that mean in my blood? It means it is ratified in my blood. It becomes valid in my blood. It was the meal that declared the covenant with all its promises was coming now into being. I want to say that again. During the meal, the covenant comes into being. The promises become reality during dinner. You missed what I said. The promises become reality during what? Yeah. During what? Yeah. Shout it! The promises become valid during dinner. Now watch this. This is, I think, where the real truth now comes in. Let's read it again, verse 19. He took bread, gave thanks, and break it. Give it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. What does that mean? You got to hear this now. What did he mean by do this in remembrance of me? Now, if you don't understand the covenant... If you don't understand the truth of the covenant, if you don't understand the word of God, this may sound a little strange to you. Strange to your ears to be commanded to eat bread and drink wine in order to remember the Lord. That's not what he said. What does it mean what did he mean when he said, remember me? That's where the big question is. That's the real heart of the whole message. Meals, lunch, dinners have tremendous significance in all cultures. All cultures. Think about it. We mark, we as people mark every significant event in our lives with a meal. Every important event in your life, you, you, you have dinner, you have lunch. You, you mark that with dinner. Uh, weddings. There's a dinner after wedding. Anniversaries. Uh, birthdays. Even business, even business deals are often uh, uh, closed with dinner. Because meals have, have, have tremendous significance in, in, in all cultures. The Lord Jesus often had meals, lunch, dinners with people. Uh, he, he went to the example to the wedding at Cana. He ate, he drank with them. The feeding of the 5,000. He went to the house of Zacchaeus and ate with him and brought evangelism to his home. Not only at the Lord's Supper, but he even ate with them after his resurrection. The night he came, Sunday night, when they saw him for the first time, 
the first thing he said, I want to eat. Now, this is, there's, there's a reason why he did it. Jesus cannot be revealed without dinner. Oh, yeah, you better say wow to that again. He cannot be revealed without dinner. That's what, what happened on the road to Emmaus. Their eyes were open as he broke bread. At dinner, he reveals himself. We miss all this truth during communion because we're not thinking about ha having dinner with God. We are thinking symbolism. Forget the symbols. This is dinner with God. It's called the Lord's Supper. Holy Communion. The Eucharist, the Catholics call it. Mass. But they too have lost the meaning of it. Many people in the church have lost the, 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 the power in it. I'm simply, in their minds, I'm eating bread and drinking grape juice, remembering a past event. No, it's not a past event. Communion is not something, hear this, I beg of you. It's not something symbolic. It sounds strange to, to the man or the woman who, who doesn't understand covenant. To understand what Jesus meant by, remember me by eating bread and drinking wine. That's not what he meant. What did he mean by remember me? Keep listening, I'll tell you. Jesus often had meals with people. And during those meals, there was something powerful that happened in every one of them. In Acts chapter 10, verse 41... Paul, uh, I should say Peter, in Acts 10, 41, Peter, the apostle, clearly states that after the resurrection, the apostles ate and drank with Christ. Jesus had dinner with the apostles after his resurrection. Why? He could not reveal himself without it. It's really a dinner of revelation. It's communion. There's union in the communion. But we've lost the union and the communion. We don't even get it. So Acts 10, 41 clearly states that the Son of God ate with them after he rose from the dead. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses. Chosen before of God even to us, Peter says, who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. But the question is, why? why? Why would Jesus eat with his apostles after the resurrection? He, wasn't, he was not hungry. He ate because they were hungry. And they were not hungry for food. They were hungry for him. For in dinner he reveals himself. In dinner he gives the promises. In dinner he imparts himself. In dinner he embraces the church. In dinner they become a part of him. Flesh of his flesh. Bone of his bone. During dinner. I think you need right now to lift your hands and have a praise break. I don't know how you can handle it anymore. Come on, praise him in the Holy Ghost. Bringing sons and daughters. Bringing sons and daughters into the family demands a meal. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? In Luke 15, the, the father said to his oldest son, it is right we have a meal. 
because your brother was dead, now he's alive. Yeah. A meal brings back sons and daughters into the family. You cannot experience fellowship with God without dinner. Do you know that a lot of people that have walked away from God experienced fu full restoration only during communion? It's something we have, we've lost. We've, we don't get it. So the father tells his oldest son in Luke 15, 15, he says, it's right. It is the right thing that we are having a feast because your brother was dead and now he's alive. We always forget what the psalmist said. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why? Why the dinner? You know, he talks about the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I'll not want. He makes me to lie in green pastures, restores my soul. And there in the midst of that psalm, he talks about the covenant meal. He talks about that holy meal of victory. And while he's eating, the enemies are looking on, defeated, afraid to attack because the shepherd is having dinner with David. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies, and while I'm having dinner, thou anointest my head with oil. Are you getting what I'm talking about here? While I'm having dinner, thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runs over. And while I'm, ha while I'm having dinner, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It took place during dinner. Did you get what I said? He talks about the Lord is my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me to lie in green pastures, restores my soul, and gives us all the grip. And then he hits you hard, he says. You prepare a table, and while I'm eating, you anoint me with oil. Therefore, it is impossible to be anointed unless first you have dinner. The oil shows up during, during Louder during dinner. We've forgotten all about dinner. Don't stop playing. Not going to lead you, brother. There's a holy anointing here. You better lift your hands and praise this holy name. Come on, people. Just praise his name. The covenant demands more than faith. Because we must celebrate our union with God with our entire person because you see my brother when you have dinner the the entire person is involved the bread and the wine become the door between two worlds the bread and the wine is the point of contact with the world of the holy spirit the meal is that point where we meet god we we'll talk about the meal. What is that meal? What are we served in that meal? He said, this is my body. This is my blood. Partake of it. Eat it. But to understand the meal, we must understand the words, remember me. Remember does not mean... Think about what happened in the past in your mind. It doesn't mean that at all. Now, how can you remember, how can you reconstruct a memory if you were not there? Did you hear what I said? 
How can you reconstruct it in your mind if you were not physically there? So it cannot mean think about it. It cannot mean reconstruct something in your head that happened 2,000 years ago while you were not even there. When we say, remember, in the Western world, yeah, it does mean remember, but in the Western world, it, it means uh, think about something that happened in the past. Re re reconstruct something in your head, in your mind. Think about it. That's not what Jesus meant. And this is where we miss it. Because often during Holy Communion, we, we, we struggle to see the, the, the cross. You were not there. How do you know to remember? So what did he mean? People are taking bread wondering. He said, remember me. How do I remember him in a piece of bread? It's not what he meant. How is that remembering achieved? It's not a mental activity. It's not a recall of an event with the mind. To think about a past event. That's not what he meant. That's not what he meant. To the, to, to the minds of the apostles. To the minds of the Jews. That, that, that believed on him. It was not a mental activity. He thinking about. Because God had already trained them in the Passover. The Passover was to recreate the whole event. Listen, God said to Israel, He said, every year, recreate the whole event. Not, not just think. You have to recreate the whole event with your children and grandchildren. To remember doesn't mean to think. To remember means recreate it. Reenact it. Bring it back into the present. That's what it means. Remember means to recreate the event. Bringing it into the present. Reenacting it. Employing the rituals and symbols to help you. To bring it into the now. To remember is to identify with that event, to participate in all the power of it, to come into the event as though you were there. You say, how? Keep listening, I'll tell you. Every year the people of Israel, the, pe the people of God in the Old Covenant, remembered their deliverance from Egypt. And so what they did is they reenacted, recreated the event in the Passover meal. Everything they ate spoke of an event that took place in Egypt. They ate bitter herbs. They, they, everything they ate in that Passover dinner spoke of something that happened to them. It wasn't just what they ate, it's what it meant. It's what it meant. So the people of Israel, the people of God, remember their deliverance from Egypt in exactly the same fashion it took place. They, in reenacting it in the, in the meal, the meal became the recreation of that event. Remembering the, and, and that's what Jesus meant by remember me. He said, reenact it. Recreate that event in your heart. Because that recreation, that remembering, is the bridge that brings the past and the present together. Watch what Jesus said. Jesus did not say, Think this. He said, do this. The words never came out of his mouth. He never said, think this of me. He said, do this in remembrance of me. 
It's not a thinking, it's a doing. Jesus never said in, in Luke or any other gospel, think this. He said, do this. Do means reenact. Do means recreate. It's an active participation in the historical reality of the past. By reenacting it, we release the power of that moment into the present. I'm going to say this again. By reenacting that event, we release the power of it into our lives, into the moment. A pastor got sick. I know that pastor. And uh, the doctors told him that he, he's going to die with cancer. He said two things brought my healing. He said communion and your CD on healing. He would play my CD of the promises of healing all night long. And God healed him. But why was he really healed? Communion. I think it's time you and I start having communion every morning. Don't leave home without breakfast with Jesus. Or don't go to sleep without having dinner with Him. I told you this will change your life. But it's not about remembering, it's about reenacting. It's about recreating the event. Because in whatever moment of time you do this, whether you do it in the morning, you do it in the evening, in the afternoon, this past moment will become a present moment. You and Jesus together ratify the new covenant in the now. Every time you partake of dinner, it's ratified again. Valid again. Functional again. The promises become functional as you eat. Listen to me. People go around confessing. By stripes I'm healed. Nothing happens. Why? Because it's all words. But during dinner, the words become real. Yeah. During dinner, the promise becomes real. We participate. You for you didn't hear what I said earlier because some of you were writing too fast and didn't really get it. Here's what I said. I said, in that dinner, in that meal, we're embraced by Him. We meet Him. His promises become real. We participate in the promises of the covenant as we eat. Nothing happens till you eat. You bring the past into the now. And it's the Holy Spirit who brings the past into the now. It's the Holy Spirit who brings you into the presence of the living Christ. It's the Holy Ghost who brings you into the presence of the guarantor of the new covenant. In remembering, in reenacting, in recreating, because that's what it means. So when Jesus said, do this in remembrance, he was saying, reenact the event. Recreate the event by dinner. Just like the Jewish people reenacted the Passover by what they ate, by, by, what, they by, by, by what they tasted, what they ate. Now this is something very remarkable, that in the Gospel of Luke, he, he records two special dinners, not one. Jesus, in Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, had dinner with the 12. But the dinner was not uh, fulfilled. He, the meal was not complete until Judas left the room. So in Luke, we have two, two separate dinners mentioned in Luke. We have Luke twenty-two nineteen, where he has dinner with the 11, really, because Judas had to walk out. But the next dinner that's mentioned is Luke 24, 
30 where he has dinner with the two on the road to Emmaus. And there's an amazing, awesome truth here that I'm going to read because I believe this is what should happen now in every, in every meal. Every meal. Every time you have this meal with Jesus, this should happen with you too. And I believe that purposely the Holy Spirit recorded this because it says in verse 30, it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. He was having dinner. He took bread and blessed it. He did the same thing he had done before the cross. He broke and gave it to them. Their eyes were open. Watch this. And their eyes were opened and they knew him. When did they know him? While he broke bread. So in both times Jesus gives thanks. In both times he broke bread. But the first time he was instituting the meal. The second time he was celebrating the triumph of Calvary. The achieving of the covenant. The first meal was the institution the second meal was the celebration. So we celebrate in that meal. He was made known to them in the breaking of bread. It says so very clearly in verse 32 and 35. Listen to this. And they said one to another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us? By the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. But look at verse 35. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. My God, this is it. He was known, he was revealed while he broke bread. And how he, he was known of them in breaking of bread. So when we break bread with him, he makes himself known to us. So we remember him at the celebration of the covenant meal. And there he is. And what did he say to us? This is my body. This is my blood. The early church partook of that meal as the body and the blood of Christ. Listen to me carefully. I know this is, this is where it gets a little tricky here because there's so many controversial things about this. Because Catholics believe one thing and Pentecostals believe another thing. But let's come to what the Bible really, really teaches. It is a great mystery of our faith. We have to, to accept it by adoring faith. It cannot be explained. It just must be accepted. Don't try to explain it. Just accept it. It's a mystery. Of course it's a mystery. I said that to you earlier. The mystery has come to us. The mystery is in our lives. God has revealed it to us in Christ. That is reality. His reality is revealed in a mystery called communion. So the early church did not have to explain it. No place in the Bible, not one portion explains what the mystery is. They simply present it and it's accepted by faith. Today we have to have a scientific discussion of what it means. And we lost the power of it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16, we, we come to the, to, the, to, the, to the truth of this. When Paul the Apostle just hits it right there on the head. He, he, he says, here is the truth. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says this. Listen to this. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? He said, the cup is the blood and the bread is the body. Now watch what he says in verse 17. For we being many are one bread and one body. Why? For we are all partakers of that one bread. When we partake bread, 
we partake of the body of Jesus. And when we partake of the body of Jesus, we become one in Jesus. The communion unites us. This Holy Supper unites us. For he says clearly, we being many are one bread, one body. Why are we one bread and body? Because we have partaken of that one bread. Who is the bread? Jesus. Because in verse 16 he says, The cup which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? And the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, here's what he means by communion. The word communion means fellowship. It means to participate in. A uniting together in partnership. A, a participation in. Listen, so Paul is saying, in eating and drinking, we the believers participate in, unite with, have fellowship with, have communion with the Lord Himself. We participate in, we have communion with, we are in fellowship with Christ. So when we partake communion, we are actually partaking Him. And this is the great mystery of the covenant. Because a believer eats of the bread, drinks of the cup. In so doing, he partakes of Christ himself. The early church never once asked questions about this truth. They simply embraced it. And the Lord made reference to it in John 6. You all remember, Jesus made it very clear that his body is true bread and his blood is true drink. And many of them said, who can handle this? And they walked away. This is John 6, verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth in me shall never thirst. But look at verse 51. Here's what it says, ladies and gentlemen. This is God's precious word. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. Look now at verse 53 through 57. Then Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, means pay attention. I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. What is this? It's, it's communion. Because Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. Now listen to this. This is awesome. The bread and the wine is the door to eternity. The bread and the wine is that contact with God where we receive the blessings of the covenant. Healing for our entire person is found in that meal. I repeat, healing for the entire person is found in that meal. Because in that meal, the glorified Lord calls us to the covenant meal and the food He serves us is His body and blood. And in faith, we reach out. In faith, we partake of the mystery and we say amen to it. And at that moment, we are nourished with everlasting life. Now, in saying this is my body, 
given to you. Jesus said, I give it to you. This is my body. Eat it. Jesus at that moment is giving us himself with absolute finality. Giving one's body means the surrender of one's intimacy. Giving one's body is giving the totality of his being. Do you understand what Jesus meant when he said, this is my body? Take, eat it. He was giving us. He was surrendering himself to us. This is intimacy that cannot be explained except by the Holy Spirit. In drinking his blood, we drink of his life to never die again. Think about this. In eating his body, we become one with him. In drinking his blood, we become one with his life to never die again. Lift your hands and thank him right now.